but I hit post and then I realized I've misspelled your last name. Hold on a second. No. <laughs> Most people spell my first name wrong. I think I got that. Yeah. Isn't it funny how, I don't know if you have this experience, but I do, is that I cannot not see your full name, whoever I'm talking to. Yeah. It's like, you're not Janice, you're Janice Boyton. <laughs> <laughs> it's all like squished in the other. Okay, so this is live. Oh, I was out gardening today and the black flies here are horrible. They're out to get you, huh? They get, they get like right on my hairline underneath my hair. Ew. Oh, they make me itch. I mean, I took a shower, but I still, I still feel like they're they're around me. You look up and there's like hundreds just swarm swarming around your head. It's like horrible. Ick, ick. We don't have any of that. <laughs> we have so a little bit of a gnat problem under my grapevine. I've noticed, and so what I've been, oh, we're live now. What I've been doing is, um, I wouldn't did is I put a, a bird feeder underneath the where they've been swarming so that the birds will come oh. over and eat the bugs as wow. they go over to the thing. Okay, now how do I share this to love? We can't have bird feeders because the deer go by and knock the deer, the bird feeders, they knock up the seeds No, out. you're That's kidding. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> oh, geez. They're a pain in the ass. What I love them. Kids? And they'll walk through the yard, you know, they'll be like the other day there was 11 on the lawn, but this uh -huh. pain. they're a pain. We don't have that problem. Well, there are deer, but not. Well, we live right on a the edge of a nature preserve. Oh. And the, the herd is often very um, uh, stressed because there's so many of them. Uh huh. They cull them once a year, but people around here don't like it when that happens. Well, no, Bambi, killing Bambi. I know, but they're a pain in the butt. <laughs> okay, let's see. All right, anybody who's watching this, I have just, I'm almost ready to go. B-O-Y. I just misspelled Janice's name, so I just, I have to get that fixed. <laughs> it's going to bother me if I don't. Thank you. So you're watching. You're, yeah, I mean, I could have fixed it afterwards, but still. Okay, so there's a, about a 10-second delay or so, in case we say some bad, bad words or something. I don't know why. There's, a, there's about a 10-second delay from what people see on Facebook um, compared to what is. Um, so I'm assuming I'll, see, I'll be able to see the videos, right? When you put oh, them yeah. On. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. I just want to. Yeah, I mean, I can oh, Darn it. Still. Hold on. I just want to share this to my page, share. We're almost ready, guys. Share to my timeline. Already hot. <laughs> Do I need to mute this? No. People are looking behind the scenes. Okay. Okay. Rob's here, Sarah's here, Carl with the K is here. Okay, let me move this over to a corner so I can look at it with one eye. And there's the conversation. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone out there in Facebook land. So good to see you. It's 1014. Sorry for a little bit late start this morning. There's no technical difficulties or anything like that. I just misspelled Janice's name and I had to share it everywhere. Uh, and, um, I, and also on YouTube, because this video will eventually go up on YouTube. And I want to welcome you to the About Time Presents, which is in conversation today with Janice Boyton, who is a friend of mine, who um, I've actually met in real life. <laughs> Once we hung out and had a great time. We did. At Icon this year. And that was, that was a blast. So what we're going to do today this is going to be a really interesting topic, everyone. And uh, my goal is to, um, this is aimed at the, the people who don't have a really great um, 
working uh, definition or working understanding of facilitated communication and rapid prompting method, which are two. Um, it's, it's a pseudoscience that has been debunked over 30 years ago and uh, people such as uh, James Randi were instrumental in helping to debunk it. And we will be breaking it down in a little bit of detail and I'll also be showing some videos that are maybe like a minute long that Janice and I will be discussing. The reason why Janice and I are gonna be discussing this and not me and somebody else is because Janice is an expert in facilitated communication because she was a facilitated, she was a communicator for um, a period of time. And she was one of the people who was tested and um, she'll go into that in a little more detail. And Janice has talked about this in writing before, but she really hasn't talked about her experience in a live, you know, on a video. And so this, this is a, probably gonna be a little bit, um, one of these kind of conversations that may be a little emotional because some of the videos we're gonna show you are going to be painful, I think, to watch. When I watch them, I don't see them as this, amazing thing that these parents are doing to communicate with their children. I see it as abuse. And so um, hopefully Janice and I will explain that to you why we, well, that's the way I see it. So I assume that's what Janice, uh, I'm not putting words in her mouth, but let's, let's, let's first Janice, why don't you introduce yourself? I, um, I am currently living in Maine. And um, in fact, I just got in from gardening. The black flies here are, um, drove me back in the house. They're crazy. We have a black, we have um, more than four seasons. We have a black fly season here. Um, I'm currently an artist, but I started out my career as a speech language clinician. And um, I have a dual major in speech and um, elementary education and then went on later to get a master's in education. Um, as Susan said, I, I got involved, I, I probably should explain what facilit, do you want me to explain what facilitated communication is first or do you want me to talk about um, my background and how I got into it? Mm, let's what do that in a sense? second because I want to talk about something else really quick. Okay. Well, Janice says she said she's an old town name, which is a dime to visit. <laughs> Sounds so nice. Old Town yeah. Canoe. They that's where the Old Town Canoes originated. So they had this oh. the the um I think I read somewhere that they had this three-story brick building. It's torn down now, and they used to test the canoes by chucking them out the window um so that they would crash onto the onto the parking lot below. Then if they were tough enough to last that, then they were tough enough to go over rocks in the river. Oh. I could be spreading a myth, but that's what I think happened. I think I have my next trivia question for next, <laughs> next trivia night. <laughs> so nobody pay attention to that little bit of trivia. Um, Janice and I met, well, met. She joined the Girl Skepticism on Wikipedia project in 2014, May of 2014. So it's six years now. That's wow. amazing. That's I, had, amazing. I had to go look that up. I didn't remember it. Yeah. She joined back in the days when there was just... I think there was like maybe 20 people or something in the group. So it was, it's been a while. Um, as far as uh, the GSOW project goes, Janice has, I don't know if she knows this and I had, I had forgotten this, that she's written 27 Wikipedia pages. Have I? Wow, yep. cool. You want to take a guess how many times those Wikipedia pages have been viewed, Janice? Oh, uh, I have no idea. Yeah, I hope a lot. Well, what would you think? Um, 10,000. I don't know. 10,000 only? Oh my goodness. <laughs> See, I told you I'm terrible. <laughs> 1,430,513 wow. times. Excellent. How many times have been viewed? Yeah. So that's, that's amazing, really, when you think about it. Absolutely amazing. So when Janice joined, she had heard about the GSOW project from many different podcasts, and she was an expert in facilitated communication. And her idea was we got to, you know, change these Wikipedia pages. And I said, do you remember what I told you? Slow down. <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> no. I, said, I said, you cannot go in and start changing the Wikipedia pages for facilitated communication because you are, you have a conflict of interest and right. no, you can't do that. I Plus said, I knew nothing about editing Wikipedia. Yeah, and you had no idea what you were doing and you just wanted to go in and do it. And, and people have approached us that way in the past where they thought, you know, I'm, I want to go in and change, you know, vaccine this, or I want to 
get rid of homeopathy. It's like, well, no, you can't quite do that. It doesn't work that way. So I made to go through training and that was more cumbersome training back in 2014 than it is now. It's much easier, you guys, much more streamlined. I should do it again. I, I'm kind of rusty. <laughs> oh, you're, no, you're fine. So um, one of the hallmarks of Janice, whenever she was training and well, not only when you're training, but when you were writing Wikipedia pages is you didn't know when to stop. That's so true. it was always a fun thing that I would have to come in and say, Janice, you're done. Janice, you're done. I'd say, put a fork in it. In it. <laughs> Stick a fork in it. You're done. Because she would just keep going. And she'd go and I'm like, girl, this is not a book. You're right. Yeah, it, took me, it, it took me a while to figure out that it's it's an encyclopedia page. You're yeah, supposed we can to just like, stop at a certain point. Yeah. So, so I'm glancing over to the side only because I can see that there are people, who, a bunch of people who joined us right now. Hello, people. Oh, great. Yeah. Hey. And um, you'll be able to ask questions, hopefully pretty soon. I'll, I'll kind of keep an eye out once in a while as you're making comments, but um, I will so keep in mind that I can't really follow exactly what's going on in the conversation. So if you really have something that you need to tell me, I don't know, send me a private message and I'll look at it. I'll see it on my phone that will come up or something. Okay. So. Yeah, so I really got into, interested in editing Wikipedia. I spent a lot of time, um, I think for about two years, I did, I did the bulk of those pages, I'm pretty sure. And um, I really like, uh um doing the research and and i like kind of quirky people i kind of got into the bigfoot people and you, you know did, like didn't you? strange the, the the weirder the better i kind of like them they just have such personalities um i did a couple of ufo kind of related pages some people that were involved with that and uh um ufos UFO. What was his name? Yeah. The guy who who started hypnotizing people, and then they were able to know that they were actually yeah. had um, been abducted by aliens. Gosh, I his can't name think of was. His name. Um, yeah, it I'll eludes me right now. But he had died. Oh, um, he was an artist. Bud Hopkins. But, yeah, but oh, Bud Hopkins. Yeah, he was an interesting guy. Yeah, definitely. You know his. Yeah. He was an page. artist. You and wrote. Yeah, yeah, I love that you use the artist angle. But he yeah. had died when you, he was already dead by the time you wrote that Wikipedia page. So we yeah. don't expect a lot of page views for somebody who's dead. I mean, you know, unless there's some notable event that comes up, but you know that Wikipedia page has been viewed 107,000 times. Really? Cool. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> I'm looking right now, I'm totally shocked. I think probably, probably more because of the UFO aspects than his art. His art did, he, he was, he was a, um, he was recognized as an artist, but I think he, he's got some art and some museums and stuff, but I think his his claim to fame really is the UFO the angle. Stuff. And yeah. another one that I think your training, you wrote for your training was Heather Dewey Hagberg. Yeah, she, she was interested. DNA. Yeah, she, um, she took um, pieces of people's DNA that she found off cigarettes and, and um, hair and things. And, um, and that's when um, 23 and Me had just started, so she could uh, and you know do it yourself DNA kit kind of thing. So she um, got profiles on the people that she found, the strangers that she found through these um, um, cigarettes and hair and things, and um, and made masks based on um, the features that she was able to recreate the it the, opened it actually for her it opened up a whole discussion about privacy and um, what do you do with deep people's DNA and whose whose property is it and she's back in the news is she I've seen for um I saw an article about it she had come back in the news for some reason I can't remember what the reason was but there was she was back because probably the privacy again there yeah it, kind of she's really into yeah i think she <laughs> developed a spray where you could spray and you know, it would take care of your the evidence of your fingerprints and things and so she she had all kinds of really interesting angles on that more than just being an artist right very interesting here let me let me see about sharing this over here i could share a screen so let me just show what we're talking about here real quick you guys um so you can probably see these things this is like she would take she would take dna just found dna and try to recreate their faces and and in these kinds of masks and it was really fascinating 
how um, how realistic they are. But of course, we don't know if it's actually a rendition of the person because we don't right. know who the person is. So anyway, that was a Wikipedia page you had written, and it was because you had listened to her interview on skepticality. You you were mm -hmm. a great listener of podcasts. I don't know if you still yeah. are, but you were. I am. Yeah. yeah, when I do my artwork, I listen to podcasts. That was really. I think I think that it, that used to have a tag. I don't I, maybe still there, but it it's um, it, you can tell it's one of my early ones because I think there was a tag on it that says um, this isn't written like in, an encyclopedia page. It, need, it needs to be edited down to to. I think, your, I think it was the thing you trained on. I think it was your first page. Oh, good. Okay. I think so. Um, I could probably actually look. 2014, <laughs> September 2014. Yeah, it's been viewed 33,000 times. Yeah. yeah, you wrote uh, Gene Mercer. Really nice. Yeah. Nuts, the 2016 film about quack. That was great. Uh, Spoonbenders, the novel. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Uh, Jean Harold uh, Brumbon. Yeah. That, that yeah. was suggested by Ben Radford, who was a friend of his. He's the folklorist. Yeah, that was a, really a lot of urban legend books like uh, what was it about the Dalmatian dog and I I can't remember it's been Doberman so Pinchers yeah. something about Doberman Pinchers and yeah uh, uh, baby trains and so he's got 58,000 views okay so I guess we've talked enough about <laughs> Wikipedia and all the things you've done besides that and you're she is an artist I have one of her pieces of art right on the other side of the screen. You guys can't see it. It's absolutely beautiful. I look at it every day. Uh, Thank you. It's adorable. And I have got to get to Maine and um, see the beauty of that area because it sure does look beautiful. So I've got a lot of things to show people. A working definition of what facilitated communication is. Let's start with that. Go ahead, Janice. Well, facilitated communication is a... Um, it's a communication technique that is being used with people with severe communication difficulties, um, mostly people with autism, but they've um, they've tried to expand it with people with cerebral palsy or people with um, Down syndrome and you know other other um, other disabilities that cause people to have severe communication problems. And the idea behind it is that the facilitator provides physical and emotional support so that the person can um, type out their words on a on a well on a keyboard or back in the day it was a typewriter but a keyboard or a letterboard or um, iPad or that kind of uh, some sort of communication device. Mm -hmm. um, and how how long how long has this been going on? I understand it came from the Dutch, right, and then moved to Australia. Yeah, um, Denmark, I think, um, explored, the, discovered it in um, the 70s, 1970s. There may have been some versions of it before then, but that's when, you know, that's a documented case. And they actually debunked it back in the 70s. And then it, it moved to um, Australia where um, Rosemary Crosley um, discovered it again. And she was working with people with severe um, mental and and physical disabilities in a in a mental health institution and um <clears throat> she she got in touch with um somebody named douglas bicklin in syracuse university and and showed him uh, you know they corresponded for a little while about um what she discovered and he traveled over there and and did some um observations of what she was doing with the children, um, mostly children, I think. They may, there may have been adults involved too. I, I'm, I'm not, my, my experience with FC comes a little bit later and, and my, my focus of what I've been doing for research is focusing on like the United States. I don't know as much about the early days of FC, but anyway, it originated with Rosemary Crosley um, Douglas Bickling caught hold of it and he was so excited about it. He actually started um, uh, an, a facilitated communication institute at Syracuse University. And that was around um, 1990 was when um, he sort of released this article about facilitated communication to the um, United States. 
in the Harvard Review called um, Communication Unbound. And that kind of, it just caught, it caught people's imaginations and, and just spread like wildfire. It was in the early days of the inclusion movement. And there, there probably was a legitimate concern in a lot of these institutes uh, about the care and the, the, um, the educational systems of, uh, for people with severe disabilities. They often were neglected. There's a, there's a really bad history mm -hmm. um, for people with disabilities. And it kind of, it kind of caught that, the edge of that. And, and um, it seemed like at the time that it was a way to, to release these people from their silence and you know this miraculous um, kind of um, technique that could be used. It was simple, it was inexpensive, it was accessible to everyone. It seemed um, to work. It, yeah. And so, yeah. Instant really, results. <laughs> say that again. Instant results. Instant results, right. And so a lot of it, it actually, um, before it went through the scientific community, it, it went to the general public. That uh, was such good news. Um, the the um, promoters went to the newspapers and, and parents and they were giving these interviews and, and so it was kind of released as a miracle um, cure, not cure, it didn't cure anything. It opened up a lot of the, the um, titles are, you know, breaking the silence and, you know, breaking this prison. The, later on, there was a documentary called Prisoners of Silence and it came from the fact that a lot of the articles that were being released about it gave that impression that it was finally releasing people from that prison that they had, that there was no other way that these people were able to communicate except through facilitated communication. And wow, what a cool thing that was. Right. So let's break this down a little bit, because as I said, I want to try to make sure that everybody would be very careful, cognizant, 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 uh, Janice and I am not overdoing it with names and uh, things like that because this isn't an academic class. Obviously, we want to make sure, sure that you guys understand the what we're getting at here. So, what what I want to be clear is in the mind of the people who created this um, facilitated communication or, or continue to use it, they believe that the person who's communicating this this person who has severe autism or or, or down syndrome or whatever it is that um, cerebral palsy or whatever they believe that the person is locked in that they can communicate that in their mind they're having just a normal conversation they they can read and write they can or possibly uh, that they are just lacking the developmental way of expressing it that that they are there there's somebody there there's a whole personality that could be you know communicating with them could go to school could have relationships could have a job just it's it's a it's a person with average or above average intellect that just can't communicate it because they can't say it or they can't type it on their own and they just need assistance and that what they've done is they found the they found this miracle device or method that will allow them to use to get that out. So that's what they think, right? Now, if I got that right, that's right. They they want to define it as a motor planning problem. So the role of the facilitator is to just steady, supposedly, just to steady the person's hand so that they are able to. Um, perform the act of typing right um it's a lot more complicated than that but um it's more that, complicated, yeah. The, yeah i mean it, in reality it's it's a lot more complicated than that but that's what the 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 it's the physical support that the you know, to, to stop um tremors or to to um stop impulsive movements help them to that focus. kind of thing so that they're able yeah. to point and and um type on a on a keyboard right. some sort of keyboard so when they when they say it works, it's because they get pretty much instant results. Uh, we'll get to the reason why it seems to work in a minute. But what what in their mind, um, I'm talking about the parents and the schools that are still teaching this and the organizations that still teach it. They believe that because the child or 
student or whatever is communicating and saying things like, I love you, mommy. I love you, daddy. Um, I've been locked in here for years. I, I'm so happy that you're now able to unlock. Um, you, you've got the key to let me out. I, I'm no longer locked into this body. I can now express myself. These people have amazing abilities to, um, they've never been taught to read and write obviously because you know and now all of a sudden they're able to spell um, to some extent um, they're able to have full sentences they are speaking at grade levels that are far above where they should be as an average person of their age in who's really not had any education um, so they think and if they say to the student joey um Am I communicating with you? Joey responds, yes, I'm the one who's writing this. It's a circular reasoning kind of thing. So the facilitator is saying, well, Joey said he's writing it. So I need to believe Joey. Always believe the student. Yeah, you're supposed to uh, um, never challenge them. No, I haven't I haven't been in the training for a really long time so this may have changed i'm i i don't think so but i i um at the time that that um that i was trained and and in the literature following that um you're supposed the facilitator is supposed to um take put more stock in the typed responses than in the spoken responses so there are people who are actually speaking uh, they have some limited ability to to vocalize and speak words but you're supposed to believe the typed right so if they say no and or they push themselves the, away the from the table, table or they hit the facilitator or they trying to get out of the situation there that's not to be believed over what the person is typing or pointing to on a keyboard right there are there are some cases where like the the person, this is just a type of example of um, documented cases, but like say, say the the um, client, the, the mom, the mom wants to give the the client or her son or daughter um, blueberry pie for dessert, and the person is actually saying no, like I don't want, I don't know, I don't, I don't want that but the typed communication is yes i want blueberry pie so the 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 facilitator whether it's the mom or whoever else um believes that the person wants the wants the blueberry pie and when they give them the blueberry pie and they don't eat it then they say well they must have changed their mind so there's always this for the facilitator there's always this um mechanism to reinforce what you already believe so if you believe in the communications even if they're even if the client has a different reaction to what's being typed in your mind you change it around so that it's okay you know it's like oh that person just they, have, they just decided they didn't want dessert um so there's there's a like a, a circular reasoning that happens with uh, i'm i'm at the point now where i actually and it took a long time to get to this point but i believe that facilitator communication has very little to do with people with disabilities and everything to do with the facilitator it's all about the facilitator experience it's very little to do with with the person with disability right okay so now that we've got a really good definition i think of what facilitated communication is i want to show do you think we should show this video right now sure at that point okay so i'm going to show this video this is just three minutes long um, I'll set it up here real quick. It is recorded in, two, well, it was released on YouTube in 2014. Now it was released by a group called Saved by Typing. So these people believe this group of people, but mostly it looks like parents and their, and their ch children, they believe that this represents their facilitated communication well. They well, believe- as, as you, as you listen to the, listen, if you can pick it up, listen to the conversation because the conversation has a lot to do the 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 parents, the facilitators are are speaking and they're talking a lot about community. Let's spread the word about this. So they're really working hard within the group to convince themselves and other people that FC really works. Right. So as you look at this, this is like a 
somebody's kitchen table. Um, it's going to look strange in this time of social distancing, <laughs> how close in contact they are with each other. There's a lot of liquids uh, being distributed in this video you may see, and which makes me think that how could they do something like this today? Um, this, this is an extreme community kind of effort. Now, let me make sure. Uh, let me see how I can. Oh, shoot. I'll have to pull it from YouTube, the rest of it. I mean, from a uh, thing. I want to be make sure I can share how I can remember how to share. I, I mean, I know how to share it, but I want to make sure I can hear the, the volume. But if not, if we can't hear it, that's fine. I should have tested it before and it's my own fault. But the actions of which you're going to see are incredible. And I just made that live big share screen. Can somebody in Facebook uh, live tell me if you can hear that? Okay, what you might want to notice as you're watching this is that there is a lot of cases of these students are not looking at the keyboard. Look, she's looking off to the side. She's not looking at the keyboard. I think they're just There's a debate going on. Whoa. I love it. Yeah, what are you saying, dude? I want to thank everyone for coming. Oh. Uh, yeah. 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 See how Seth he's looking off to the side. Jake. What did <laughs> See how she had to push his head back into spot to to look at the keyboard. <laughs> See him looking off to the side as he's as he's typing on the on the keyboard. He's not looking at all. Not at all. Totally oblivious to what's happening with his hand. The mother is very very closely watching the monitor uh, the keyboard. Uh. And he's trying to type. He's quite capable of typing on his own. But uh, the parent will move his hand back because they don't want him typing on his own. They want only whenever they're controlling his hand to type on his own. Yeah, so that that kind of that particular person is is one of the questions that I have when I'm looking at that is he has the motor skills to be able to point and to be able to move his arm forward and and single out keys on the keyboard. So why isn't he allowed to um, type independently? Right. So I heard that the video was very choppy. So I'm going to go ahead and put the, the link to the video we just watched that was uploaded by a group of facilitated communication 
people um, so you can watch it. It's on your own. So, you know, when you get a chance, sorry if that was choppy and really hard to watch, but it 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 is there on, on uh, YouTube. I want to make sure I stress that they think that this video is something that represents them well. And that's why it's up on YouTube. It's not something that some group of uh, skeptics have secretly recorded and released. This was something that they said, this looks great. And case after case, watching those students, those, the, their, the clients, they're not looking at the keyboard at what they're typing. And, and it, just imagine yourself to have a keyboard, have your hand suspended over a keyboard and you can't see the keyboard necessarily. You have no, you have no way of anchoring your hand to type. And you're just like, like this, trying to, trying to type somehow or other, you're supposed to be able to see without looking. Could you, without having a way of anchoring your hand so that you can actually type, how would you, how would you, it just doesn't make sense. And yet they yeah. believe that this makes sense. Yeah, they really do. They, they really do believe this. Um, and the other thing that, that when I watch that video is um, if the facilitator is trained, well, a couple things. Um, if the facilitator is trained to um, provide the lightest amount of support as possible, some of those people were like muckled right on to They're their grabbing them, yeah. Um, and hanging off the kid, hanging off the, the young man, you know, like, I don't know how you can be in my, my question to that group is how can you be that close to somebody and that physically um, uh, the, the weight of your own body, even if you're trying not to, um, to influence the communications, how can you be that close to somebody and not influence um, where they are in that, in you know, like you're gonna even want to. If somebody's sitting really close to you, you're gonna even want to just shift. I would just mm -hmm. kind of shift your chair away from that person that's hanging on you. So that's one question. And the other question I have is, um, in the training, facilitators are are kind of taught that you're supposed to monitor um, each other and also where the the clients are looking. And not one of those facilitators that were standing around the room um, said to any of the other facilitators, hey, you know, like you're typing and he's not looking or she's not looking. You know, I'm concerned that that you're not doing that correctly. You know, we just want to make sure that we're all this is a practice session, say, and we just want to make sure that we're all doing this um, the way that we're supposed to be doing it. So there's no correction from the facilitators either um, of themselves. They're not calling their um, client or child. Um, I, I think that was a, a group of parents and they were all working with their children. Um, they're, not, they're not redirecting. Um, the only time that, that anybody's redirected was when that one, one young man was interacting with the keyboard by himself and she actually pulled this hand away. Like, don't do that. You can only interact with the keyboard and when I'm touching you. That's what's being right. taught there. So those, are, those would be my questions for for people who are continuing to facilitate if um, I've heard that um, that up to like one of the leaders actually says up to 40% of the interactions um, through facilitated communication is caused by the facilitator you know like the influence facilitator influence can be up to 50%. I think it's more I think it's 100% but <laughs> this person is is one of the leaders says 40%, like which 60% are we supposed to believe is independent? I'm, I'm, I'm curious about, uh, that's the other thing is that, that people call this, facilitators call this kind of communication independent when they're hanging off the other person and holding the other person's hand. And, you know, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm confused about what they mean by independent because to me, independent means you do it by yourself. Right. And so that's that's just me, maybe, but um, I'm <laughs> and me, <laughs> and probably everybody watching. I'm kind of curious about that. Yeah, yeah. So so you see throughout, and I'm emphasizing this strongly that 
This video is not a sting. This video and a bunch more videos you will find on YouTube for facilitated communication. Just type that in. This is not something that was released by the science community, the skeptic community, or people who had some gotcha moment. This, they decided this was their, this was what they wanted to represent how a community of facilitated people, I mean, they could have, like Janice said, they could have just said, oh, that wasn't a really good go. Let's try again. I'll get another clip and, and we'll upload that where it looks like they're really communicating, um, you know, without having any influence, but there's clearly people what, looking like off to the side like this as their hand is still going like this because it's being pushed. And then the, the facilitator realizes that they're not looking and she goes and takes her head and goes like this to look at the keyboard. Yeah, I want to point out <laughs> too um, the, the title saved by typing, even that that has sort of like this um, evangelistic kind of feel to it. You know, they're really they really feel like their their child has been saved from the the silence they were in. Um, and and the other thing I wanted to point out is that facilitated communication over the years has taken on some has taken on some negative connotations. So the names of facilitated com communication has changed. So we have to start looking at facilitator behavior. Um, so saved by tape typing is just one of the they don't use facilitated communication because by 2014, when that video was put up, um, FC had kind of taken on a bad rap. So um, Right. The names keep changing. You have to just That's look suspicious. at the suspicious. Why do yeah. we have to keep changing the name to supported by supported typing to um I, I just put the link up into the um chat that um the name has changed multiple times. Supported typing, hand over hand. Um there's been some more I thought. Um our thought was in GSW is that as facilitated communication uses new names that we put it in the lead of the Wikipedia article so that if somebody is is new to this and they only know it as hand over hand, they would be able to type hand over hand into their computer and see what it is that comes up and that would be facilitated communication. It's also known as supported typing, mm -hmm. um, spelling to communicate. Um, there's another form, rapid prompting method. So there's, yeah, we'll there's talk about things. rapid prompting method. <laughs> Oh my goodness. They're all they're they're, they're um, the the FC community has done a really good job at avoiding what the real issue is, is who's actually doing the pointing. And 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 a lot of these times you can't always sometimes facilitators and um their their disabled partner um partner I use that term clients really partners in this. Um they're yeah, being I don't know what you would say. The, the, I own their the, child. Their, yeah, the, the client or, or child. Um, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, you were saying that they are. Um, well, what I was going to say is that they're testing, that you're not allowed to test these people because to assume testing. If you test somebody, then you're challenging them. And as you were saying earlier, this is a movement of people that we're not allowed to challenge their faculties. We're not allowed to test it because by testing them, you're saying that maybe you're not actually communicating. Well, the, they, the, they've they taken the stance that if you- Assume um, competence. Facilitated communication, the technique that you're actually attacking people with disabilities, and that's just not true. Um, a lot of techniques go through um, critical evaluations, but they they early on have taken the stance that if you criticize the technique, you're criticizing people with disabilities, and and you're going against freedom of speech and and um, disability rights, and so it really very if you start um, becoming a critic of, of facilitated communication, the technique, then very soon you're attacked as a person that doesn't believe in people with disabilities. And that's just, it's not true, um, but that, that keeps people, it kept people early on from speaking out. And I know that 
that people still, um, critics still continue to be attacked personally um, for speaking out against facilitated mm -hmm. communication, the technique. Right. So and it would you, sticky. no, go ahead. It gets sticky really, really quickly. It's, it's, they, they, I, I was going to say earlier, they, they have a, um, they've done a really good job at deflecting away from the real issue. That's what I was going to say earlier. Yeah, and that's that, and that also, that's also um, some of the ways that they, they um, continue to, uh, they, they're really invested in, in what they're doing. They're really invested in their belief system and they've allowed that to um, circumvent critical thinking skills when it comes to, even when it's so clear that the facilitator is doing the influencing. The other thing I was gonna say that was that um, the, sometimes the, the facilitator influence is much, much more subtle and so it's a little bit harder to to distinguish um, the cues that are are being given off, and the only way to really know 100% is to go through double blind testing and and to test, um, you know. And if they're saying, oh, 40% up to 40% is facilitator influence, then you would think that facilitators would want to make sure that those testing um, protocols are in place. Um, I certainly. <laughs> especially after my experiences, I certainly would not want to um, put words in someone else's mouth. Right, the, the, the video that we just saw also shows how this is a community um, and much like any kind of community, and I might even say this is a bit of a cult-like behavior of uh, parents that have finally met a group of other parents who are experiencing the same kind of, I mean, these people understand each other because they know what it's like to have a child like this. And so this can, it, it would be very difficult to come out of a community like this after a, at a point, because these are your, your friends, your relationships, your, uh, your support network. Um, I mean, not only are they communicating with these students uh, or their children, and but there's all other kinds of ways that these people be form a network you know how to advocate for your child medical um um decisions um how do you how do you handle the stairs by you know being in community being in being society all the all that world that i am not i have no idea how to navigate these other parents all understand what it's like and so it's a very tight-knit community and if you were to eventually say well you know I don't think my son's really communicating I think I've been influencing him all this time that isn't going to happen you just can't because that would be saying you mean everything that I thought he was saying to me is a lie he wasn't saying it. The facilitator was saying it. It's, it's, it has a, you know, it comes back to psychics with me. I, I'm intrigued by this whole, um, everything about it, because it really does remind me of mediumship. Whereas, you know, at a seance or, or whatever, and a medium says, I'm in communication with your child who has died, little Clarabelle. Clarabelle says that you should trust me. She loves me. Clarabelle is trying to, wants me to tell you to give me your money <laughs> because I'm going to use it in the right way. <laughs> or, you know, uh, Clarabelle says that she doesn't like the color you painted the house. Clarabelle says that she doesn't like her new stepmother. Clarabelle says she doesn't like that doctor who's telling you that, that I'm not really communicating with her. Again, it's that circular reasoning. And after a certain point, when you've invested so much in this, you can't easily step away and say, maybe I wasn't communicating with Claire about all that time. Maybe that was the medium just making it up. And I, I don't think that you can leave. At no, a, no. At I, point. Facilitated communication is soul. I sat in on a, a webinar given by um, 
a person that's now at um, Syracuse University has the Institute on Communication and Inclusion. And they did a, that's where FC originated. It used to be um, Facilitated Communication Institute. It's where Facilitated Communication originated and it continues to be the, the um, ground zero for FC in the United States. They did a webinar early in January. Um, <clears throat> And kind of, I sat in on that, and I was interested to to hear FC being billed as the technique of last resort. So, a lot of these um, parents and clinicians, um, that and therapists and th people who um, currently fall into um, believing facilitated communication have tried the evidence based kind of communication techniques and have not gotten the results that they've wanted. And so they, they, they've gone through a lot to get to that point where they're trying FC and they're, they need it to work because in their heads, they think there's nothing else that's gonna work if I don't, if FC doesn't work, there's nothing else to fall back on. And, and that, that's, that may or may not be true, but that's really how they feel. So it opens up the, the door for um, facilitated communication uh, or the mindset to make sure that facilitated communication works. So once you've gone through all that mental angst, like you were saying, Susan, it's gonna be really, really hard to say, okay, this was, this was not true. This was, this was all based on the facilitator. It's, it's just a, it's an incredible emotional um, ask to, to get people to, to actually confront this thing head on. It's, it, it, it's more than it just appears on the surface. When you, when you start scratching the surface, you understand that, that people's emotions are highly tied up in this and, and needing it to work. You know, it's just, it's almost gets to a point where um, it's a survival kind of mentality you know it has to work we i we have there's no other place for our children and clients besides this fc community so there's a lot of things that hold hold those people in place right they they there is help for these students probably especially in early intervention but what it seems now i hate to put it this way, but it seems like what these parents are wanting is a normal child, a child that will be able to communicate with them, a child who may be able to live on their own someday, a child who will be able to have schooling, a child who will have relationships, um, a child, they want to show that the child is funny and, and intellectual and has normal uh, intellectual abilities and um, anything less seems to be no it's not okay for my child to be um this is my child you know this is how they are and maybe they will be able to um you know the limitations are what the limitations are and they're not able to accept that now i don't know if that's the mentality of these parents but it feels like it from what from me looking on that that they weren't happy with the what doctors and, and schools were, were giving them there was no there's no miracle they just no there isn't any miracle that i mean to to there's a uh, uh, expressive language is extremely complicated and so there's a lot of things that have to fall into place in order for that you know to to it's it's quite amazing that any of us develop quote unquote typically and so to have a person with impairments, you have to um, identify those impairments and, and um, put together um, uh, an intervention program that's going to meet those that individual's needs um, wherever those fall. So when you're when you go to an FC workshop and right away they're talking about the um, the workshop leaders are, are um, most of their, at least the training that I went through and, and in talking to other people, this is this is also what they experienced in, in other trainings. Um, they use testimonials and they, they show 
um, all of a sudden this person that was um, unable to communicate now is is in front of a, an audience, uh, a college audience giving um, you know a presentation through facilitated communication. They're writing plays, they're writing poetry and books, and um, so some some um, now um, within the last. Um, several years people are graduating from college using facilitated communication and those all you're you're kind of set up in the in the um fc workshops to believe that this could also happen to your child this wasn't just this was a typical child with the same problems as your child and now they're in front of an audience speaking to the the um united nations uh, yeah. get presented to the United Nations. That's that's a real example, and so um, so I think the the workshops, whether they intend to or not, um, prime parents to believe that that this can work for them, um, and and that to expect high levels of of right. communication. Even though, if you think about it, written language is much more complicated than spoken or receptive language so if you're if you have um limited spoken language skills the chances are that you're going to have um uh, sophisticated written language skills are pretty low <laughs> next to none um so it doesn't even the the structure of the whole thing doesn't even make sense but that's the expectation that that you're given when you go to these workshops so you're, right. you're kind of primed um you're you're there because you're looking for any these people will do anything for their child or their or their client that they, they will lay their lives on the line for these people so you're already entering a situation where that's your mindset and you're you're um looking for something that you believe is um uh um this high stakes to making it work. And you're being told by the promoters, we know this is the last resort and we can help you. And That's so, a miracle. yeah. A miracle. It's, the child can just sit down at the keyboard and immediately start typing, I love you. I love you, mom. Thank you for always being there. I yeah. mean, can you imagine what that would be like to hear as a parent of, of a 12 year old or a 15 year old that has always, has never shown anything of the sort? Um, yeah yeah so I, it, a, and you're not and you don't test it you know so oh no, of course not so, so you you as a facilitator you get into this mindset of believing what's being typed and you don't you kind of stop um well first you're not really trained very well to to check in with yourself but you're also why would you if it seems like it's working and you're getting the facilitators getting what they wanted, which is a conversation mm -hmm. with the person they're facilitating, then why would you change that? So it's it's sort of this self-perpetuating um, kind of uh, reinforcing. I don't know what the terms are for it, but you you get reinforced to continue using it, and then you get into these small groups um, that are that are um, like the one that the saved by typing parents and you kind of reinforce each other. So there's a lot of like peer pressure to make it work, to keep it working. And then you then you have this us against them kind of mentality that also creeps in um, because there's a lot of criticism around FC. And and so you're you're locked into this mental state that that says, okay, what I'm doing, you get you get I think you get deeper into your belief system when you're when you're challenged you mm -hmm. know and it's sort of like no we've seen this with our own eyes so it must work and we're going to continue to use it mm -hmm. so i want to get into the harm of this a little bit but first before we get to that i want to know i want people to do a thought experiment if if this was a person and i'd like to maybe do a quick what's the difference between stephen hawking uh, hawking's what is the correct word i can't even remember now stephen hawking's and, and uh, one of these children where Stephen used some sort of uh, device to help speak. So um, what is the difference between that and what facilitated communication is doing? Can you briefly tell me that? And then we're going to go into something else. Sure. 
um, the difference is that Stephen Hawking, I think it's Hawking, but I could be wrong. I don't know. I, I've now forgotten. Now right. that you say that, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so everybody's he, screaming he, at the computer right now saying the yeah. correct way. <laughs> Tell us the right way. Um, he interacted with the the keyboard and later on he had a, a straw that he or, you know like I, I don't know if he blew into a straw or he manipulated it with a motion in his cheek or um, I'm not sure um, to what involvement the technology was but he interacted with the technology by himself there was nobody cueing him and uh, he knew um, he had complete control over interacting with that technology and what happens with a um, with facilitated communication it's a it's a um, they call it a facilitator influence technique so the facilitator is giving off um, uh, verbal or physical cues um, and whether they realize it or not that influence what letters being typed when the conversations stop and start and um and if you take the facilitator away just like we saw in that video if you take the facilitator away that person he was pressing buttons he knew he was supposed to press buttons but did he have the understanding to type out a word we don't know that from that video and so um if you take stephen hawking with his equipment um by himself clear the room he's able to interact with the technology in a way that will produce um, a, a spoken, I mean, a, a, a written um, text, a sentence, right? Mm -hmm. If you take the facilitator away, clear the room, the person with disabilities is not going to be able to interact with the technology in the same at the same level as when the facilitator is there. So, in other words, they they may be touching buttons with the facilitator there and spelling supposedly spelling out words, but but they don't they don't know how to do that on their own. Or they may have they, well a lot of the um, the deficit in the the fc testing also what little that they do they don't have really good records about what the students can type or not type or say or not say um, before they use facilitated communication so they may have the capacity to to type out on their own uh, a limited amount of words but can they produce the the poetry and the novels and the stories and the plays and the you know the the high sophisticated sentences without the facilitator being there and the answer is no right the, and Stephen Hawking we've we've heard that it has no thank effort. you yeah uh, thank you Rob yeah that uh, yeah. Stephen Hawking had competency before and you know and he, over time you could see his his ability to be able to communicate deteriorate and spoken was, language yeah so well yeah and so he was able to he showed competency all his life up until the point where he was not able to communicate and whereas well, these students are the opposite well there are there are people with disabilities who have limited for whatever reason there may be a muscle problem or you know a, a structural problem that um they're not able to um use spoken language um, but they can be taught to interact with communication technology in a way okay, that that's is a good point. independent. So you don't necessarily <clears throat> you don't necessarily have to have you can be taught that you, you know a person with disabilities can be taught to you don't necessarily have to have the capacity beforehand. Okay, that's a good point. I, I think the I think the biggest point is the interaction with the technology. Right. So Stephen Hawking could could interact with the technology whether it's a muscle twitch or blowing into a straw or by himself and and the person with um disabilities that are using facilitated communication generally um, don't interact with the communication technology at the same level as when they when when the facilitator is there does that make does that make yeah, sense yeah it makes sense so um, going back to this idea of a thought experiment, if these people, these people are being facilitated, are locked in and they can communicate, 
fully their their uh, desires, their needs, their uh, write books, give lectures. Um, if they can do that, then they should have full rights to vote, to make medical decisions about themselves, to oversee possibly their parents' estates, um, court of law. Um, they should be able to have the full rights of, you know, not with a, a you know, competency. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm struggling with the words of how to describe what I'm trying to say is that they shouldn't have necessarily somebody overseeing them as a conservator, right? They should be able to make their own independent judgments about voting. They should be able to register for vote, to vote, right? Right. They should be able to say, I'm moving out. Bye, mom and dad. And, you know, sign a rental agreement or buy a house. They should be able to make decisions about where they want to go to university or what careers they want to have. As long as they have somebody supposedly helping them, you know, communicate. So they should be able to do all these things. Yet, we're, you know, are we even seeing that? Are they, are they living independent lives? uh i don't i don't uh getting married right right there's there's a whole issue around getting married and and how do you deal with um sexual relationships and that kind of th that's kind of tricky i would think um <laughs> well we've seen it well i mean we haven't seen it the but, uh... <laughs> um the people that are held up as the success stories for facilitated communication um, the claim is that they're living independently. Now, the, the proof of that is lacking in terms of, one, in terms of them actually interacting with the communication technology by themselves, right? But there's also, they're linked um, to their facilitator. And I've seen videos where now facilitators are saying that they're um, similar to um, an interpreter for the deaf. So they're not, they're interpreting the person with disabilities. And, and that's not actually what's, ha that's not a really good, to me anyway, that's not a really analogy. good um, comparison. The, the people who are interpreters for the deaf go through many, many years of training and they are taught really strictly not to speak for the other person. And that, and, and we're not seeing that, um, with people who are using FC, at least not from the videos that we're seeing. Um, and, and, and I haven't, I haven't seen anybody using FC in person for a really long time. So I, I'm not, maybe not, not the best person to, to um, judge that question, but at least the evidence that we're seeing in videos um, and even some of the movies that are coming out um, featuring people using FC and rapid prompting method, um, uh, I'm just not seeing that independence. I'm seeing them, um, the only way that they can communicate is with a facilitator. So I don't know how they could vote independently or live independently or make those kinds of decisions um, when they're so um, intimately linked with a facilitator. Right, well, if you think of a, a person who's in an iron lung maybe, and um, they have to have the iron lung to survive, like the facilitator is the iron, iron lung. They're just a device. They're just a method to allow them to be able to live an independent life. Mm -hmm. I mean, a person in an iron lung obviously can, you know, vote and, and make financial decisions and just make life, real life decisions. Whereas- it, It's interesting to see, like, um, I've been, um, involved with FC in one way or another since around 1991, off and on, <clears throat> more so um, since about 2012 than, than before. I took, like, there was a time, a chunk in there that I didn't really pay much attention to it. But it's interesting to, to me to see from a pr facilitator perspective, it, it, 
I always thought of it as a like a technique, just like you would use a auditory trainer or you know whatever for people with um, who are hard of hearing. Um, it's it was supposed to be just a technique, but now the facilitators identify themselves as like it's it's sort of morphed into this identity that the facilitator takes on, and uh, I'm interested in I. I just have been thinking about that over the last year or so, and it's it's kind of interesting to me, you know, like they are they are the the clients iron lung, you know, it's sort of like without them, this doesn't work, and and it's sort of like they're so you can't. It's like a Siamese twin, you know, you, it would be very difficult to extric extricate those two. They're sharing, community, you know, supposedly they're sharing this act. Mm -hmm. Um, there's definitely, you know, an, an interact, an interaction happening, but what happens, um, are, what is the person with disabilities really getting out of that interaction? You know, it's, it's sort of like one thing we know about people with autism is that, um, it's really difficult to, you know, like they, it's, it's easier for them to just be inside themselves. So I, I could see, um, just being passive and letting this happen. You know, it's sort of like, yeah, I'm getting reinforcement and I don't have to do anything. It, I, it's work right. for me to, to interact with the outside world. So I've, why don't I just let this person do this for me? You know, what well, is it they're really learning? Um, yeah, and, and you can see that it isn't a motor problem with these students. I mean, I remember reading something by I can't think of the name. I don't think it was uh, Lil, um, Scott Lillenfell. I think it was or Howard Shane. They were saying these people can pick up the last crumb from a, a potato chip. Right. I mean, they right. have no problem whatsoever yeah. getting the food into their mouth that they want to eat. They yeah. can, they, they can, there, there's no motor problem. They, they can do these things. They can touch the keyboard. They can, as we saw in the example, you they can go and they can touch it as much as they want. It's not a motor problem, which is what the parents are saying, is that they have a motor uh, issue. The promoters it's, are saying that, and the well, parents are saying yeah. that. It's That's a, a cognitive, they're not understanding that touching the keyboard spells words, and those words mean the sentence that you put in a book. Now, there's a study that um, the the Bernie Rimland was um, some some people call him like the father of autism. He 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 had an, a, a son who was autistic, and and he did a lot to promote autism. And um, he and this other person, there may have been a couple of other people involved, set up a study where they actually made a supportive device that would support the person's hand. Um, while they typed so so that it was like a cradle kind of that that would move back and forth to allow the person to to interact with the keyboard because the promoters of facilitated communication are saying that that they need the support right they they need the physical support of the facilitator so they were going to test this and they actually believed in facilitated communication at the time and they or they were they were at least willing to give it the benefit of the doubt right so they set up this um supportive device where they put the students in um the you know in a chair with a with a support for their hand and they could point and it would give them give them the support they needed to um uh supposedly through facilitated communication and they still they weren't able to type independently it only worked when they had the facilitator involved guiding so, yeah yeah so let's talk about the harm. Boy, this is this is such a really interesting topic. We have barely even touched the subject. I think this the we're gonna probably end up having to um, have another one of these conversations, Janice, because this is so you have so much knowledge and there's so much I want to show. But if I show these videos, I feel like they're gonna to be too choppy. Um, I could show pictures, but this we're gonna to have to go here somewhere else another day. I don't think anybody's going to want to watch two, four, five, six hours, or I'm going to be able to sit here that long. Um, the harm of this, first off, before we get too far into the weeds, is that if these people do facilitated communication, if it's introduced early on, 
then they may be missing opportunities to be able to actually have, there are techniques and things that they can be taught to communicate. Um, you know, right. not, not, not these long things where they're writing books and, and things like that. But if there's early intervention, there is probably some techniques that can be taught so that they can communicate. The other thing that really stands out to me is that these students, these people probably don't want to be sitting in a chair like this with somebody hanging on them, holding their hand for all this time. I mean, why do we know, why do we think that they, this is what they would want to do to attend a classroom? I mean, yeah, you can, you can see school. in the videos, yeah, in the videos, often the, the um, person with disabilities is rocking back and forth or, or pushing up against the biting facilitator, their hands. biting their hand. Um, some of them actually get up out of the chair and the facilitator chases them around the room with the keyboard trying to, and they're, you know, they're, they're, um, even in the training videos, um, I was able to see a, a, an early training video that was put out by Syracuse University, and and the the um, the the students are like standing up and and facing deliberately facing away from the facilitator, um, you know, not just not just zoning out, but like I don't want to be here, um, and so this this. Um, I think there's a lot more that needs to be done in terms of let's look at the the student behavior or the client behavior and and see whether they're this is a willing they're willing or if they're um, willing participants or not. I think that's really important. Um, yeah, I, I can't imagine that these students really want to be sitting there, and I mean it's disruptive to a classroom. I'm sure um, to have a student that. I mean, it's not, some of these videos, you, I mean, of course you wanna have compassion for your fellow human beings, um, but there's a lot going on and we are in a group of people who are reporting back to us what it's like, what these students are doing, they're hitting, they're screaming, they're, they're throwing things, they're uh, very disruptive and, and in the classroom, doesn't seem like that's something that we well there's a there's a uh i'm trying to think of the name of the movement there's a movement that uh, sorry I've, i'm drawing a blank i'll think of it in a minute but they're they're saying um that that this is part of who being an autistic person is and that we should like the the, the rest of us should be more accepting of their their behaviors, right? So we should consider them. Um, it's the neurodiversity movement. So we should we should consider the person as a whole and and disregard a lot of these behaviors. And and so the question and I I think in general I think that we we should and can be more accepting of people with differences. I think, I think that's true. That's part of the neurodiversity movement that I actually agree with. However, <clears throat> my concern as a, a facilitator looking or a former facilitator looking at some of these videos is how much is that, um, let's for lack of a better word, call it acting out behavior um, or, or, or behaviors that are indicating that they may not be completely um, happy to be in that situation or cooperative, how much of that behavior is because of the facilitated communication and how much of that is, how, how can we, that would be a question that I would have, how can we separate that out? So yeah, if they, if they have um, uh, uh, behaviors that aren't, um, are different than the quote unquote typically developing person, then okay, that's fine. Let's let's acknowledge that and recognize what those are. But is it the situation that's causing those behaviors? Mm -hmm. How do you tell? How do you tell if somebody's like uh, stimulate, you know, they're they're self-stimming, maybe they're moving their hands like this or whatever. Is that because they're anxious? Is that because of the situation or is that because that's what they need to do at that point? I don't know what I don't know what the answers to that is, but I think that I think we have a lot to learn 
about um, how these behaviors um, help or disrupt the communication act. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think, and I think, uh, I think that being that in that close proximity, I think facilitated communication has a problem because it's you're in such close proximity um, that that those those behaviors may be a result of being in close proximity and not right. and not being in the situation they would like yeah. to be in. Yeah, I don't know if that's clear, but I, you know, it's sort of like, I, I think that- I don't know, because we can't test this. Because right. we can't ask them because they're not gonna be able to give us an answer independent of the facilitator, so. Yeah. But to me, when I'm looking at, there's a Washington Post um, example where you, where the student, the client is biting his hand. Well, to me, that's not typical behavior. That isn't that's self harm, and 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 the the facilitator just like rams through it, and just tells them, "Oh, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna be fine, you know, whatever." It doesn't. There's no addressing that behavior. Not even an attempt to have him stop biting his. Don't bite your arm. I mean, that's that's. That's true for everybody. Don't bite your arm. That hurts, you know. <laughs> and so, so there's there's some behaviors that are being accepted when facilitated communication is involved that may or may not be um, justifiable for the person with disabilities. I have I have big right. questions about that. You know, I wanted to also mention that we see facilitated communication in mainstream um, commercials and so on, and. I don't think we have time to go on to talk about this today, but what I was thinking is you will see videos, uh, these really feel good videos. Um, Apple has done some with their keyboard showing um, uh, people using their product and it's very carefully edited, just like the psychic step, where you see the person and it's, it's this feel good moment of the person is finally able to communicate using this Apple device or whatever device. Yeah. But what you see is you never see them typing independently, number one. If you see their fingers on the keyboard, a finger on the keyboard, like maybe, you know, with just hit and peck, you don't really see the other person's hand. It's, it's cropped out. So you just see the hand typing like this, but you're missing this. So, um, these are Apple and other companies think they're helping by showing this autistic person who's finally been able to find their voice when really it's just careful editing. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen people give speeches at like commencement addresses and so on that are facilitated communicators. And you think, how is that possible? But what it is, is they record something and a computerized voice speaks out later. And when they go up to lectern, uh, they push a button and then the computer, computerized voice says, I am so-and-so, I'm so happy to be here. Now I have found my voice, blah, blah, blah. They're not like doing facilitated communication at the podium. And those are carefully crafted in advanced um, audio. Uh, one we were watching not too long ago, the facilitator or the parents up at the stand, and then the student comes up and stands at the podium and didn't really know what button to push to make the audio play. Mm -hmm. And I think while he was speaking, I think he left and another one, the person just left and went and sat back in the audience where he was. And they're like, well, I guess he doesn't want to be up here at the lectern, but we'll play the, the audio anyway. <laughs> It's it's getting trickier with the the more advanced the technology gets the the trickier it is to um, to identify, especially with careful editing. It's 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 um, getting harder to identify who's actually doing the communicating. Mm -hmm. So the there is a legitimate reason um, Stephen Hawking, as an example when he was giving interviews, he would get the questions ahead of time and he would program the technology to answer right. those questions. So all he did have to do during the interview was press a button. So that's legitimate. What mm -hmm. isn't legitimate is people using facilitated communication to get those messages into the, the 
um, communication device mm -hmm. and then having the person um, you, there's a question like who is who is programming the the, the, right. the machine to be the pre-recorded if they're using rapid prompting method or facilitated communication to to type out their their pre-recorded messages then who's actually doing the communicating they may have the you ability to part. press one button they may actually do that but who's actually put that those sentences into the communication device right. so yeah. it's yeah this is where you think you're just going to talk about fc and a simple technique but it's really complicated <laughs> there's so much going on but there are these videos as i say you will see out there in commercials even and and it looks like the person is like oh my gosh i mean we, we'll have to another time talk about dj um which is really what we're encompassing but, but what i want to talk about is the uh, is your experience and what happened because um i think that a lot of people are really going to want to hear that so maybe if you want to give uh whatever you feel like sharing maybe 10 minutes of that so that we can keep this under two hours <laughs> okay um well when i got involved with facilitated communication it was in 1991 and I was trained by a facilitator that had come into the school with a, with a, a student. Um, so I learned through her first. Um, then I ended up going to a two day training at the University of Maine um, and was trained by somebody who had trained with Bicklin. So the next layer, the first generation of facilitators were giving these workshops at University of Maine. Now what happened in my case, and this is the speed version and, and, and and um maybe we I could do another talk it on it more in depth yeah. give us so some. um over a period of time i was i was the uh, speech clinician at the time so it was sort of decided among the group um that because i was the supposedly the language expert that i would pursue looking at facilitated communication during my lessons with this person and so, and, and she had this other facilitator. No, I saw um, an article that I had written early on, like shortly after um, mm -hmm. all this blew up, my experience wasn't a good one, um, that said there were several facilitators, but I only, I, I only remember one main one now, you know, like, so mm -hmm. I believe that one, that early on there were other facilitators, but in general, we were all um, getting the same information. And so they they teach you to kind of um, there's kind of a progression of events. So you you do maybe fill in the blank first, and then you go to sentences. And more and more, you're supposed to look for um, cues in the in the written language about um, whether this is come uh, independent. You know, it, it's the other person or not. So senses of humor, like jokes and. So we got some of that over time and and then um at one point she um she hit me and like like in the face you were facilitating face. a child i was facilitating a child right and she hit me and in my head by then i was saying the, there's a big thing in in the the fc community where the it only works with people you trust. It's, it's like the psychic stuff too. You know, it's like it only if you're skeptical, it's not going to work. But if if the if the person trusts you and you trust the process, it's going to work. And I had bought into that, and it was pretty actually pretty exciting because we were starting to. This is a person that was fairly nonverbal. She um, didn't really interact that much um, with the academics, and then all of a sudden, you know, we're getting sentences, and you know, she's starting to show us sense of humor. Um, and then this, this, she hit me and, and um, now looking back, I think she was just overstimulated and didn't want me sitting next to her. But at the time, there was a lot, it was, again, it was in the early 90s, there was a lot about um, people in special ed in particular, um, were more highly prone to be um, subject of abuse. And so whether it was the conversations that I was having with other people, uh, um, the other that were working with her, or just my own thoughts or a combination, I believe that maybe something was happening at home. You were you were so primed I, for abuse, right? 
you right. were primed by by your instructors and uh, all that you were learning that these right. people were normal that it was commonly known that they are likely to have been sexually abused or right. physically and, abused yeah and and so you were when looking you go for to the, when, I, I went to the workshop after the abuse allegations came out so um <clears throat> but when you go to the workshops they also tell you and th this this probably the the other facilitator had already been privy to this information so i'm sure that we and we shared information but um they say that when somebody's first learning how to um communicate with facilitated communication often they are angry and they're gonna because they, they haven't been able to tell their story and that to expect these stories to come out mm -hmm. so we got to a point where um both both of us maybe the other uh, if there were other the facilitators other facilitator? we were we were starting to get little glimpses about maybe something was happening at home enough so that we had a conversation um about it the the her special ed team and decided to move forward if it was a typically speaking child we with this information that was coming out we would move forward and call the department of human services so we did that and and i because i was the the um the senior person um the senior facilitator i went into the dhs interview with her um and and did the interview with her and the outcome of the in interview was that there was um graphic abuse going on at home now none of this is true i want to make that clear <laughs> this is but just the story was, as she's telling it yeah 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 your experience yeah, the story as i'm telling it we believe that there was um graphic pornographic um, by the father abuses yeah and the brother and, and her brother and, yeah family members and so, um, yeah, this is always tough to talk about. Yeah, I know. Um, so what I, I'll make sure that we come back to why, why we think, why I think um, the sexual abuse has happened. Let me finish telling the story and then come mm -hmm. back to that. Um, so what happened was the kids, the, the, child that I was working with and her brother were taken removed from the home and um, they um, uh, proceeded to investigate the family for abuses at home mm -hmm. and during that time I was a facility I continued to be the facilitator and um, but between what the 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 um, court appointed the child the children a guardian at litem um, his name is Phil Warden. He he is in the Prisoners of Silence show um, that was put out in PBS by PBS in, in uh, 1993 um, that talks about the case I was involved with. And so what he did was smart. And I don't know why this isn't protocol for, for every case like this, but it isn't, um, but smart. He said, well, we need to figure out what's going on. We need to figure out if these communications are true or not. And so he did a little digging and um, he came up with um, Howard Shane from Boston Children's Hospital was doing testing for, for these um, kinds of cases. And there was also, which I didn't know about at the time, but there was another, there was the uh, OD Heck Center in New York had also done the first double blind testing in the United States. And he, I, at some point he was privy to that as well. And what they found was they were trained from Syracuse, the facility, I think there were five facilitators and they did double blind testing. And in every single case, um, there were hundreds of, of questions asked, but every single case was what the facilitator had seen mm -hmm. and not what the people with disabilities had seen. They were doing, um, they were comparing pictures. So the facilitator would see one the the um, person with disabilities would see when sometimes they were the same, sometimes they were different. And every single answer was based on what the facilitators had seen. So they decided that the best course of action was to set up a double blind testing. Now I had gone, to, by then I had gone to the um, two day training at the University of Maine and they, they say 
they were saying at the time, you know, don't believe the skeptics. They're they're against us and don't test this. It's a it's an affront to the people with disabilities. Don't test facilitated communication. So I was frankly stuck between a rock and a hard place. And you know, like, do I do I go against facilitated communication and agree to the double blind testing, or do I, you know. Uh, I, and I knew that the family was hurt by that, you know, like mm -hmm. what it was a really, it was a really messed up situation to be in. Mm -hmm. um, quite an emotional struggle. And, and Phil Warden, to his credit, um, had earned my trust. And he, he was like, well, you know, every concern that I had, well, I don't want the testing situation to be hard on my client, you know, make sure that she's okay. And he's like, I'll be there if anything's messed up, you know, then I will protect her. And, you know, that he kept reassuring me. So because of that, mostly, um, and, and a desire, I mean, I, I did want to know what was going on, but at that time I was, I was more in favor of FC. I came out of the workshop more sure that I was doing it correctly than when I went into the, to the, um, workshop. So, I agreed to do the double blind testing. And um, what happened was that they they did the same kind of picture identification exercise. Well, you, were, you couldn't see what she was seeing. Right, so he had a folder. He had a like a manila file folder mm -hmm. and there were pictures that were there that were taped on there. They, so they were flat, there were flaps. Were they like common items that she should have been able to recognize? Cat, cat, shoe, bicycle that kind of stuff. Things that know. she would have known because yeah. she had used those words in the past. Sure, yeah. And um, and then they asked me a bunch of questions about um, things that I wouldn't know about her family life. Like what color, color is uncle so-and-so's car? Like, I don't know who uncle so-and-so is and I don't know what color his car is. And um, those kinds of questions. And then they asked, and then another one was, um, they took her out in the hallway, Howard took her out in the hallway, showed her a key, told her what it was, um, and then came in and said, you know, what did you see in the hallway? No answer. And then pulled out the, the key from his pocket. What's this typed out key, you know, so. Um, but yeah. you didn't so, know that it was a key that was being shown to her in the hallway. So therefore, no. as a facility. So I didn't, didn't know, know I was blinded. Said. Right, correct. I was blinded from that information. And so what happened again, the same with the OD Heck study is that every answer was based on what I saw and not what she saw. So um, also what happened for me personally, and I don't know if this happens to other facilitators, it'd be really interesting to, to know, but during the double blind testing, I had these moments in my head where I was like, I wonder what picture she's seeing is it the same as mine or different and so to me that sort of set the seed for I was thinking about this the other day because someone asked um like what the conversation was like I, I think the conversation all facilitated communication happens within the head of the facilitator so I think I think they um and this I got from you're not going to see this in the literature you know this is from experiencing double blind testing in the situation so um, if you're, I don't know if, if anybody's an artist or a writer, or there are times when you're just in the flow of something, um, that time just passes. Um, and, and that's kind of what a FC conversation is like, okay, I'm writing a, I'm writing a short story and everything's clicking and, you know, like I can write for an hour and not really think about the words that are flying in my head, you know, the characters seem real, the conversations seem real. And then all of a sudden you think, Oh, I forgot to put the the wash in the dryer. So those are the two different conversations that happen in your head. You know, like there's this really clear, like this is me, this is FC kind of conversation that goes in your head. And th so I was having these breakthrough moments. Like I don't know Uncle So and So. You know, I wonder what color his saw his car is. And so for me, that sort of plan, it took me years to figure this out, but I, I actually do think that the, car, the, the facilitators develop this idealized version of the person they're working with in their head and that's who they talk to. That's how come the conversations can happen so long, you know, and over a long period of time. And when it's questioned, 
like in a testing situation. I think it happens all the time. I think those, those questions, if you read the FC literature, there are um, little notations like, well, some of the facilitators thought that they were influencing the person. So I think, I think those questions happen all the time, whether you're in being tested or not. But the difference is when you're not tested, they go in and out of your brain really quickly. I think I moved their hand this time. I won't next time really quick mm -hmm. seconds, right? When you're in a testing situation, you got people looking at you, you're, you're self-conscious, you know, your feelings are right here on the surface. You, I notice everything, every movement of my hand, every thought in my head. And so those breakthrough moments actually was a gift to me later because I could figure out, I didn't, I didn't have the critical thinking skills enough to um, not get into this situation, but I was taught if something goes wrong, you try to figure out what happens and why. And so that sort of, though I, I kept answering those questions, you know, like coming back to that question, you know, how can the conversation go on for so long? It's because it's in your own head. Mm -hmm. um, so what happened with um, my client is that the, the, because of the testing that I went through, the, 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 um, the uh, charges were dropped, even though a lot of damage had been done. The, the, it was irreparable damage really to, Stigma to the parent, to the father yeah. and the brother. Yeah. yeah. There's no smoke without fire kind of. Right. Right. And, and so, um, I, I was, I apologized to the family. I, I helped stop, um, FC in the school system, but it can't, it can't erase the damage that I did without, I mean, one of the reasons why I talk about this, even though it's, it still makes me really emotional, mm -hmm. but even, even, though it's it's a horrible experience mm -hmm. i talk about it because i want people to really good hearted well-intentioned people to think about what they're doing and make sure that they're what they're doing is evidence-based mm -hmm. you know and and so um there's a i i still believe i mean i have mixed feelings about the leadership but the rank and file facilitators i really my heart really goes out to them but they're wrong you know and 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 it's hard to say that it's it's like you're I've lost friends over this family members, you know, it, it hurt my reputation as an educator. Um, I think I've because I've um, worked through a lot of that and I continue to to educate people. I think some of that has come around a little bit, but you know, I can't I cannot repair the damage that was done um, by going with emotion first and then critical thinking second. It has to be the other way around, especially if you're influencing other people, if you're teaching other people and people with disabilities deserve better than what we're giving them when we do facilitated communication. So um, that's me kind of getting <laughs> Absolutely, on. and I know this is an emotional subject and we've had this conversation many times, but not publicly like this. It's, it's your, your story is, powerful because we don't have the insight we don't have what's happening in the head of the facilitators because any facilitators from what i understand that have come to the realization that they probably were doing the communicating themselves they disappeared and no i don't, don't think have... they get to that yeah i don't know i don't know if they get to that point um they, not they... every facilitator who goes through double blind testing the od heck people were particularly, uh, they're my heroes, really. They they set the stage for being able to say, I was wrong and I'm sorry. Um, but not every facilitator who goes to double blind testing believes that. There are people who, who have similar situations to mine where there were abuse allegations made. They went through the double blind testing and they're still using facilitated communication. This is still being used. Including, including the leadership. So there was a case in um, around the same time um, and, and this is, I've got the newspaper clipping, so I feel comfortable um, saying this. Rosemary mm -hmm. Crosley, uh, who's the leader of facilitated communication, and I think it was nine of her facilitators, had the first abuse allegation case in Australia. And they, they, they the court was like, this is a travesty, you know, what you have put these people through, and they're still using facilitated communication. So, so the path isn't clear. And, and what I think happens, like for me, <clears throat> I happen to have 
for whatever reasons, I had support enough that spoke to me and my personality um, to get myself out of that situation in terms of believing it. But um, it takes a tremendous amount of emotional fortitude to be willing to say, one, I was wrong. I hurt people, mm -hmm. you know, and this isn't, um, I think there was a point where a, a point where I could have very easily said, well, I just need a little bit more training. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I didn't have enough training, but because the, the FC people are really quick to anybody that if you, if you look at the, the reports, their abuse case, there was an abuse case, um, reported in the newspaper a couple years ago. And I know, oh. if, I, I know that there are, are um, ongoing investigations currently that don't, some of them don't actually ever get to a public, you know, situation. They're not reported, they're settled before they get to that point. Um, current day, this is happening. And um, um, I lost my train of thought, but anyway, <laughs> I, I just get, I just, it just, I know, like, I, 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 there's so many um, different avenues that we could go through to, I mean, we could, we could be here for 12 hours. I mean, I, I, I there's so much, and I, I am going to ask that we do these, at least a couple more of these to get this story out and explain, because I think for people who are watching, they don't understand what the harm is, first off. Right. Right. They think if these are people who are at their desperate worst, the, the, the system has given up on them. At least they're getting some kind of help, some kind of attention, some kind of somebody's trying to pay attention to 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 them. And what's the harm in in, in something like this? Um, well, I also I think that's what people would think. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and especially if it's a parent working with their own child, then what's wrong with that? But I also, and there are there are parents who disagreed about whether to use facilitated communication and not say the husband didn't want to and the mother did. And then all of a sudden the father's being accused of abusing the child. So, um, and what happens with the FC leadership is that they say they're really, 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 really quick to say that's a bad facilitator. And they don't support, they don't support the people that they're training and they right. don't, um, to my knowledge, I mean, there's been people that have gotten in touch with me to um, give me a hard time over email and stuff, but there's, there hasn't been anybody who's a pro FC person that's actually come forward and said, let's have an honest um, discussion about what happened to you and in, in, in using facilitated communication. Now I'm thinking if they're really interested in correcting the errors, because this isn't just me that this happened to, even though early on it felt like that, Mm -hmm. But there's been tons of people. Um, the other thing is that the the um, I looked at the um, controlled testing and and looked at the facilitators and where they were trained and how long they were trained. It doesn't matter whether they took a two day workshop or they were been using facilitated communication for five or ten or thirty years. They're equally susceptible to facilitator influence. There was no difference between. Um, when they're when when they're put under controlled situations, there there's not absolutely no difference in the in the research that I've looked at. And so, if there's this flaw in their technique, you would think that they would want to do everything that they can to to make sure it doesn't happen. Once is bad, you know. It's like and it and you know it's like what are they thinking when they you know it it goes up to the leadership that this happened to. Mm -hmm. And, and it's sort of like, um, uh, anyway, I, I, I just think that the, there's a, they've dropped the ball, the leadership, uh, somebody asked me how many people have to get hurt before you stop using facilitated, excuse mm -hmm. me, facilitated communication. I, and that's what I'd like to ask the leadership. Right. And how I, many people have to get hurt before you look at what you're doing. So that's just me just <laughs> I mean this is 30 years later and I'm this emotional right you know I spend you know, a ton of time with facilitated <laughs> communication talking to parents and experts and it still gets me it's still and there I, it's if this is a miracle that a, a technique that allows people 
who are locked in to their autism and unable to communicate, well, damn it, let's get this out all over the world and show that this works. Let's use this technique. If it's that amazing, then we should be using it just just like with psychics if you are really in con connect uh, connection uh, connection with dead human beings that yep. once lived if yep. you are really doing that why are we not using this all the time why do we have juries why do we have a police force why do we have uh why are we have historians and genealogists when we could just ask the dead person you know, and that's how I feel about facilitated communication. If this really works, then they should do their darndest to make sure that they've crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's and done all the double blind studies and, and proved it beyond a reasonable doubt that it works. My cat even says so. I know. <laughs> he finally woke up and said, I agree with my mom or whatever. Yeah, but there was a study, there's a study that just came out recently that that they to prove agency in using this is rapid prompting method which we really haven't talked about but it's, yeah, a, it's, we'll another, it another, it's another form of facilitated yeah. communication just take my word for that and and but they skipped the double blind testing and they and they they went to to um what is it public access so they paid to have their their article published and they got to choose who were the were the um peer reviews and so they're they're calling it a peer reviewed study that's out there that says that that um eye tracking works oh, with that's another support, thing we have to facilitated communication and then have to do a thing on just eye tracking just yeah. rpm just our tra eye tracking i also want to talk in depth about some of the other cases and the harm that has happened because that's these all need to be discussed and yeah need to be yeah, out there. I, yeah i think so too and and the thing is people look to the abuse cases and understandably they're they're sensational and they're they're deeply disturbing um and and i recognize all that and that's when fc gets gets a lot of press you know and and but it's not just that it's it's everyday living that harms people using facilitated communication because every every moment that that facilitator is moving that kid's hand is a moment that that person isn't able to communicate independently. So right. I think Your voice has been think taken along, from along with educating people about the harms, the obvious harms. We also need to get across that that it's harmful just to do this technique. It doesn't work. It doesn't. We've known it. We've known it for you know, the um, ASHA, uh, American Speech Hearing Association and American Psychological Association and, you know, big name organizations um, wrote opposing policies for FC in the mid I think by 1994, 95, they had these policies in place and they periodically review this and they look at the, the literature and they're looking for evidence-based measures and they haven't changed their policies because the evidence is just not there. And so the, so something's gonna change. Either we need to, we need to um, um, put regulations in place or, you know, like somehow, I don't know how you do it, but, you know, force, force people's hands using facilitated community if they're going to say it's true and they could solve it within an hour i mean this question could be and you know and truly if somebody went through the same kind of test double blind testing that i went through and came out with a different results like legitimately in cold controlled situations i would i would consider that mm -hmm. um but i i have a feeling that I do too. the result is going to be the same because that's what's happened every time they've put controls on this technique. It just can't work. It I can't mean, it's work. it's an implausible technique. It just I mean, can't. If, if you look at um, as, the as Ouija board, used. automatic writing, those are all like really popular in the early 1900s. And, and the scientists looked at it then. They know how that works. Yeah. And they yeah. know it's, 
it, they know it's the it's the person using the planchette or or holding the pencil or whatever. It's not some entity outside right. yourself. It's you doing it. And it's and still so process. it's not like this is new. I mean, and it's, it's being just, taught. Facilitated communication at, is being taught in universities these days. I don't know about today because we're in a lockdown. I don't know if they're still teaching it at at Syracuse University in New York and uh, Northern Iowa. And, um, well, but I know not. that before this break, before the planned, uh, pandemic, these were taught courses and workshops are being held in universities, which gives it that feeling that it's legitimate. Mm -hmm. Because if you're, if you're teaching this in a speech class or whatever they're, they're doing, this is happening and I remember you showing, um, sharing a, a, an advertisement for how much these facilitators are being are being paid through the Medicare system. What is it, fifty four thousand dollars a year? Yeah, in Vermont, they they um, support FC at the state level, and you're able to use FC and get Medicaid reimbursement for it. And they're using it in their designated some of their designated agencies. Um, which uh, um, are state-run agencies, and they're using them for counseling sessions. Um, and they're they're um, I've heard back. Um, Vermont's interesting because because there's a lot of people behind the scenes that will say, "Oh, FC, you know," it's, but they will not talk to you in public. There's such pressure to keep mm -hmm. FC going in Vermont, in the state of Vermont. Um, but there, there's some pressure to, to um, start it up and or use it again in public schools. So there, um, the, it's, it's a, it's insidious, you know, it's, it's sort of, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what it's going to take to, to get people to stop this. Um, I well, think I think it's, it's going to take, take people like you speaking out and what, what has happened and this is my personal opinion again is that when facilitated communication in the 80s and the 90s and maybe the early 2000s, I get it. You think you're helping. You think this is amazing. You are you're benefiting these students. They're giving them voice. I get it. But now, since 2015, when we wrote that, the GSOW project wrote an extensive, detailed Wikipedia page about facilitated communication. And then in 2017, the GSOW project wrote the rapid prompting method Wikipedia page. Today, if somebody is approached in the school system saying, we're going to have you do facilitated communication with the student over here, um, but we really don't want to call it that. We're going to call it hand over hand, or we're going to call it supportive typing, or you know, don't bring this up too much because it's kind of controversial. You know that's what's happening. They're not saying, go ahead and use facilitated communication is what you're talking about. Yeah. They're going to tell these people, don't do too much research on it. Don't just go with it. You know, this helps. And, and then all of a sudden the student sees this person who's a, a teacher's aide or whatever, sees that this miraculous event, they have a responsibility to do due diligence, to look and do at least a Google search on yeah. this technique, facilitated communication, rapid prompting method, hand over hand, supported typing, spelling to, what is communicate. it? Communicate. Spelling to communicate. All these terms are in uh, Google and they're gonna lead you directly to a Wikipedia page. And there it is spelled out in the first paragraph that lead, it is carefully crafted to say what it says in there so that you know immediately that what you're looking at is so controversial that the Wikipedia page even has a pseudoscience tag, I believe. Let me look before I say that. Yeah, <laughs> alternative and pseudo medicine tag prominent oh. on the Wikipedia page. It cannot be missed. So there's no way in my mind I'm thinking that any thinking person who has some sort of education who duly cares about this they would not have something raised in the back of their mind thinking, this just seems a little amazing what we're able to do. And maybe I, and they're telling me not to look into any criticism of it or not to talk too much about it as being what I'm doing. 
that they have the they have the responsibility to at least read uh, the beginning of a Wikipedia page about it and go, wait a minute, this doesn't look quite legit, and go to their go to their um, supervisors and say, I have found some very interesting. Um, I, I'm beginning to challenge what it is you're telling me to do, and I'm concerned about it. And then every all the abuse cases are listed on that Wikipedia page. So if somebody wanted to find it, many, they can find yeah, it. Many, this sound, this the the um the ones that have made the papers. There's many, many more. Oh yeah, of course. That haven't made the. I mean, how long can we make the Wikipedia page? We have probably I don't know 25 organiz listed on the Wikipedia page organizations that have made statements support opposing facilitated communication. These are serious, legitimate organizations, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiat Psychiatric, the American Academy of Pediatrics, Federal Trade Commission, Speech Pathology of Australia, Scottish Intercollege, Intercollegiate Guidelines yeah, Network, New York State Department of Health, these are legitimate agencies that have made statements opposing facilitated communication. So if somebody today decides, I think this is going to be my path and my career in life, and they have not even done the basics of looking into it, they're they're this they're part of the problem. Gone are the I just want to help people and yeah. I'm, I'm no, I'm not buying it. Yeah, I'm not buying it at all. And the people who are now the my cat's having a sneezing fit in the corner. <laughs> These people who are administrators in this have pretty much been in this for 30 years, right? They drank the flavor aid 30 years ago. Yeah, they're funding their their relationships with people. Their um their whole life's work is in this, and they're not likely to say hmm. I think maybe this is harming people. They I can't. think I'll get out of it. No, no, they can't. No, they can't. And the parents who have been doing this for years probably can't get out of it either. This is one of these things that has to be nipped in the bud for anybody who's about to start, uh, for any university or college or school that's trying to use it or teach it, it has to be eliminated. Mm -hmm. This is one of these things that has to be just line drawn in the sand. No. If you can show us that with double blind studies and so on, that this is a legitimate method that actually helps people. Okay, but until that happens, we're done. No, I'm not teaching, I'm not teaching uh, uh, automatic writing in, high, in, in a college university either and saying that I'm able to get messages from spirits. This is kind of the same thing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, using a Ouija board. We can't, we don't teach that in university, even though people say it helps. They've gotten messages. Um, administrators really. I'm off my soapbox now. <laughs> yeah. I feel very passionate about this. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what's going to change Syracuse, the, the um, department, the, the um, uh, speech communication disorders department um, has right on there web page we don't support facilitated communication or support at syracuse typing. new york they've distanced at the university distanced themselves but their administration they can only their whole department has made a statement against facilitated communication but the the institute um continues to exist and has a lot of money into the money university so all of the money and yeah, I don't know i don't know what it's going to take to bring this down you know I'd, I'd, it'll be interesting to well, eventually people are going to have to just, you know, it'll just die out. It'll take a generation, obviously. If we cannot allow more people to, if we can't, if we can get to a point where we can keep this from being taught um, in universities, I mean, obviously we can't keep organizations outside of, of uh, federal funding or anything like that. If we can get that to a point where it ends and no new students are being taught this in schools, um, or taught to use this technique, it'll eventually die out. It just has to, but that's 20, 30 years. But we have to leave yeah. great documentation of it what's going on, or it'll just rise up again in 40, 50 years. Yeah, 
it oh, died out of Denmark, technique. and then it hopped over to Australia. So um, I don't know. It, it will go away. We just have to make sure it stays gone away. And I think, I mean, this, the, pro, the problem is bigger than you and I, Janice, and, and the network you put together of 100 people or so that are actually, you're in communication with, it, that have not had a link to each other in this way where they can talk about this and we can coordinate efforts to, to, to uh, make lasting effects. And that's, again, another topic for another day because we're at two hours and I, I could go on for another two hours, but I don't <laughs> think that people want to listen to us talk for another two hours. And it is freaking hot in my house for some reason. <laughs> I'm not having a hot flash. I'm just hot. <laughs> I, don't I don't know what it is. But um, so let's end this today. Do you have any final thoughts that we could give in the last couple minutes? And promise me that we'll, we'll have another one of these conversations or two sure. or three. Yeah. Um, this has been fun. I, I absolutely adore listening to you just the wisdom just kind of just oozes out and i'm well, like I, I'm yeah, so but that. get that get that little piece oh i want that one i want that one grab it she's she just it's just so amazing and you say that you can't help you know you can't fix the problem that happened to you but i know that's not true every time you speak out every time that you that there's another article or that something that's written or something else is done that's helping because it's making these people, the parents who, who yes, were harmed and this child and the little brother was harmed because people are gonna say, well, there was no smoke without fire. And so maybe there's something going on, of course. But every time you do talk out about this, it's giving them more, see, see? I mean, here's the facilitator telling me that she didn't mean to do it, but this is what happened because yeah. of these reasons. So it is helping. I hope so. Yeah, I, I'm I hope sure they've moved on with their lives. I'm sure they have. They had to have. I mean, it's been 30 years. Yeah. The, 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 I, I know a little bit about their lives and some of it's pretty tragic, but um, yeah, I think it's been really difficult. I think it, I think it set the stage for not, not very good. Right. Outcome. My heart goes out to them. The, the yeah, one that, my, me too. The, me too. the one in uh, Florida that happened just a few years ago with a hand over hand um somebody was teaching hand over hand to a student in the classroom i'm not even sure this the parents approved this at all um uh, and then the father was accused and the father's in in jail because he's a man of color uh <laughs> so he yeah. ends up getting to go to jail he's totally blindsided by what the heck i don't even know what you're talking about and you know i think that he didn't even know that this was happening that the child was teaching this and that this accusation and and the i mean immediately he's put in jail and based on the word of somebody who's a facilitator of a child i mean it it's cruel and it's wrong and we have to stop this and the best way to do it is to do videos like this and to make sure the wikipedia pages are written and to do talks at psycon like you did which was amazing <laughs> thank you so much for doing that you're welcome i hope they're yeah, going to do another one i talk with you hmm? yeah i i guess i would say that um what i've learned um first of all i feel really really fortunate to have met the people that i've met because i was willing to do the work on this thing I think that we need to hear from more facilitators um, to understand not just my story, but um, you know, I've, I've started to hear from a few that um, tried it and then for various reasons stopped using it. And I think that's a big missing piece in the literature. Um, so I, I, I still hope, I, as far as I know, I'm the only facilitator right now speaking out. The ODHEC center those um facilitators spoke out for a while but they've retired or one one was killed in a car accident and you know they're not they're not active anymore um so i would like to it would be interesting to hear other people's i think we need to hear from everybody to understand what was going on like culturally and and whatever psychologically um what's going on that keeps us in place i think we could do a better job um, autism is a like this big hotbed for pseudoscientific treatments. I think we Absolutely. could do a better job um, as a culture 
uh, in right. a society to to address those issues that, because I think those issues kind of open up space for pseudoscience to step in and provide an easy answer to really complex um, situations. Um, and I, I just would like to say thank you for all the support that you've given me and that other people, um, I think in some ways I've been harder on myself than other people have been. Um, yeah, I think you have. And, not so and I don't, I don't blame you at all. This, um, is, this is a very horrible thing to, to have gone through and been a part of and the guilt and the stress I'm sure must be enormous. And to think that maybe we were going to turn our backs on you uh when you tell your story i think that we in the skeptic community have are better able to deal with this because we've been there ourselves i mean we believed in crazy things too of course i have as well you know astronomy and, and astronomy <laughs> astrology i believe in astronomy astronomy that's horrible <laughs> but yeah um I think it's important. I think that that um, I think that we're seeing the end days of facilitated communication. I have said so since we met. Um, I think that that was part of the the. Um, I hope that I've been able to direct your energies in a better way of making um, making a difference. I'm hoping that that's when you and I met. I consider that's kind of the beginning of the start of the end of facilitated yeah. communication. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I learned how to do research for one thing, you know, and, and make, you know, like making doing your point theory. in a place that it's going to be read. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then just um, talking to there's there's people who have reached out, experts that have reached out, Howard, I'm still in touch with Howard Shane, and there's many others that have reached out that have been um, right. then dealing with this for a really long time. And they've really helped answer my questions. They've stuck with me when I was, you know, it's, I think as long as you're answer, answering questions, you're heading in the right direction. You know, it was literally, I was left to, because the FC people dropped me like a hot potato. Of course. The school yeah. system didn't really want to talk to me because they were afraid that I was going to bring a lawsuit into the school system. There were lawyers calling me about, you know, for the family. And it was, it was really, really stressful. I was left to basically to Alone. deal with it on my own. And if I can help somebody not have to do this by themselves, um, it's hard enough. Um, and, I, and thank goodness, I mean, Howard Shane, John Palferman, he was the producer for, for um, Prison of, of Silence. I, I talked with him behind the scenes. I was getting pressure from my, the school system I was working at not to speak out publicly, but I did speak with him privately. And he, they were the ones that got me access to the, the evidence base information that was starting to come out. And just from there, it's, it's just sort of been um, partly because of my openness to talk about this and try to figure out what was going on. I've been really, really fortunate to, to meet some really cool people around the world. You know, it's, it's um, I would say- They're, they're amazing people. people. And you're one well, of them. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I do want to mention before we sign off that um, the facilitated communication Wikipedia page has and now I'm probably a hundred of these views because I've looked at it so many times for many reasons, but it's hit 292,889 views since we wrote it, rewrote it in 2000, March of 2015. So um, that's a lot of people getting a lot of great information. And yeah. I think that if, if anybody out there watching has a passion about some kind of pseudoscience, that before you try to take any actions, um, speaking out or making pamphlets or writing a book, make sure the Wikipedia page is in the best, um, uh, best case possible, because that's where people are gonna get their information. Linda Rosa has a quick question. She says, have you noted other forms of quackery associated with facilitated communication? And yes, uh, psychic even, but we're gonna have to talk about that at another time because we're way over two hours. But yes, we have. Yeah, it's very similar to automatic writing and, and Ouija and psychic readings. Right. And Remember the guy who did psychic, uh, he, was, he was channeling somebody psychic. He was he was getting her messages psychically 
and uh, wrote a book. Remember that? Oh my gosh. Yeah, no, I know. And then there's, there's so much. A, like, there's so much. Isn't there a part in the there's some people in the the um, Jewish community that um, that believe that people using facilitated communication are are um, prophets and stuff? So I haven't um, heard that. That's that's yeah. something I hadn't heard. No, I think I think actually um, um, Linda was the one that found those articles for us. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, just too much. Okay. So this is going to be located on the the YouTube channel, and obviously it's going to stay here on on uh, Facebook. Um, I ask people if they would subscribe to the About Time channel on uh, YouTube, also to subscribe to the Facebook page for About Time Presents, which is the About Time Project. Um, we're going to be doing lots more talks over time. Um, this has been a lot of fun for me to do these talks. Um, Janice is going to has agreed to do many more talks with me about <laughs> facilitating communication because we didn't even touch uh, eye gazing. We didn't really even touch uh, facilitating communications other its sister um, rapid prompting method. We yeah. didn't talk about the abuse and the harm too much. We barely even touched that. We didn't. Uh, what we didn't we talk do. about how. Yeah, we didn't talk about how the how I think these messages come about either. Right, and yeah. your the insight you have about the poetry is really, really interesting. Um, there's just a lot to go, and I think a series of talks will be really interesting. So we do also our um, our organization is called About Time. We do have a website called AboutTimeProject.org, and if people want to find more information on that website, there is some information about facilitated communication that Janice has linked to on there. Um, the Wikipedia page for facilitated communication and rapid prompting method are absolutely wonderful resources for people to, to, to get information, especially basic information. And then they can follow the links in the page to get more advanced. Um, if they have more serious questions, they can, they can find that in the, in the citations on the Wikipedia pages. It's a great place to start. And uh, we do have a donate button on our About Time project page. Um, Janice has another project coming up with a journal that we may be um, needing to raise some funds for, and Janice can talk about that when we get a little more information. But um, if you'd like to donate, we are a nonprofit 501c3, and uh, PayPal does recognize us as um, a nonprofit. So um, if you were, if you wanted to donate a few dollars, please go ahead and do so. You can, it is tax deductible, and it will become in uh, use for other projects that we have done over the years and are continuing to do in the skeptic community. So I'd like to thank Janice for sitting with me for two hours. That went by in a flash. It did, yes. Uh, that was a lot of fun. I know that um, this is not an easy subject to talk about. I had a lot of videos I wanted to show, but the time doesn't, there was just no time. And then um, for some reason or other, the video we were seeing was really choppy. Yeah. And so I put the link to the video in the, the notes and I'll put it on the YouTube channel as well. So people can look at those. They're all over YouTube. They're, they're oddly not trying to hide this. And they're also linked on the Wikipedia pages. And um, so that's where I'm going to leave it for today. Thank you so much, Janice, for joining me from Old Town, Maine. We are on totally different sides of the world. I'm all the way in Salinas, California. I'm almost at the coast. I mean, 30 minutes, I'm in the I'm in the water. On I'm about an west. hour and a half from the coast on this end. Very so. close. So we're yeah. almost at extreme ends. If I was in Los Angeles, then we'd probably be even more catty-cornered. But boy, we are yeah. far. I'm really going to miss seeing you at Saigon this year. So anyway, all right. Thanks so much, Janice. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. Bye.